Your patient presents to the emergency department with altered mental status and an unclear medical history. You obtain a head CT without contrast and notice intracranial hemorrhage. The blood appears extraaxial as it's in between the brain parenchyma and the skull, but where is it exactly? Is it epidural? Is it subdural? Is it somewhere else? To best answer this question, let's review some simplified dural anatomy. Deep to the skull, there are three layers of dura that help protect the surface of the brain. The dura, the arachnoid, and the peel layers. The places where blood can accumulate are defined by the spaces in between these layers, the epidural space, the subdural space, and the subarachnoid space. There are a couple important anatomic features to key in on that help determine the shape of each specific type of hemorrhage. First, notice that the dura is spot welded to the skull at sites of sutures. This creates well-defined epidural compartments within the epidural space in between these sutural lines. Second, notice how the dura dives in between the cerebral hemispheres and forms the falks, which divides the subdural space into two at the vertex. Finally, the subarachnoid space, which contains CSF and feeding vessels to the brain parenchyma, follows these grooves on the brain surface called the sulci. Let's return to our patient. Notice how the hemorrhage has this lens shape, which is very typical of epidural hemorrhage. But why does it look like this? Remember that the epidural space is in between the skull and the dura, so blood accumulating in this space will spread freely until it hits one of these sutural lines, in which case it will start projecting inward towards the brain parenchyma, giving it this lens shape. It also gives epidural spaces the defining feature of typically not crossing sutures. Here's another patient with extraaxial hemorrhage. What do we notice about this bleed? This hematoma has a much more crescentic shape and appears to spread freely along nearly the entire surface of the brain. However, it doesn't seem to cross the falks, and in fact, it appears to spread along the surface of the falks. These are classic features of a subdural hematoma. So why does it look like this? Remember that the subdural space is located below the dura and thus will not be hindered by these spot-wielded suture sites. Thus, subdural hemorrhages are free to spread across the surface of the brain, unlike epidural hematomas, leading to their crescentic shape. And remember, since the falks is made of dura, it will not be able to cross the falks at the midline but will rather spread along its surface. This is a distinguishing feature of subdural hematomas. Let's look at one more bleed. This one looks a lot different compared to the other two that we just saw. Well, it looks like it's filling these sulcal spaces rather than spreading across the surface of the brain as we saw previously. This patient has subarachnoid hemorrhage. The shape of this hemorrhage, again, has to do with the configuration of the space that it occupies. The subarachnoid space is filled with CSF, and it occurs between the arachnoid space and the peel surface along the very surface of the brain. When blood enters this space, it will often dependently fill these little grooves in the brain that we call sulci. It can also occur in other spaces that contain CSF, such as the basilar cisterns or the ventricles. These are all part of the subarachnoid space. Let's review what we've learned. Remember that each type of hemorrhage have classic shapes, which are defined by the spaces which they occupy. When evaluating an extraaxial hemorrhage, Remember to pay close attention to anatomic landmarks such as the sutures and the falks to help you determine what type of hemorrhage it is.